Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show, where we get to the heart of why you overeat and how to stop. If you struggle with food and weight like I did, welcome home. Welcome everybody to the Heal Your Hunger Show. So happy to have you here. It is a great day to be alive and I'm so excited about my guest. She is a powerhouse and also a good friend and I'm so happy and excited to have this discussion with her today on speaking up, speaking out, you know, getting what we want without being bitchy about it. So this is, <laughs> this is going to be good. Um, so yeah, so I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, hey, listen, if you're new to the Heal Your Hunger show and you, you're wondering what this is all about, I want to tell you that Heal Your Hunger takes going deeper. And that's what we talk about on this show is we're not about diets and weight loss. You know, um, that's the effect. That's the side effect of going deeper, of dealing with the underlying causes. So um, if you want weight loss, great, you're in the right place, but don't expect a whole lot of conversation about calories and exercise and ketones and all that stuff. No, 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 no. We're going deeper. So, um, so I'm glad that you're here. I hope you enjoy the show. And we are going to be recording this live um, in just a second in the Secret Sauce group. So if you have not joined us on Facebook in the private Secret Sauce to End Emotional Eating Facebook group, please join us there. That's where uh, uh, Cindy and I are going to be chatting and you can be part of the conversation for upcoming shows if you're part of the Secret Sauce group. So just jump on Facebook and type in Secret Sauce to End Emotional Eating Now and you can join us there. And you'll also get up to date, hot off the press invitations, news and um, you know a little bit about my personal life and and just anything that you know can help you know that you're not alone in the struggle of food and weight that you have comrades and and other other women you know locking arms with you to really enjoy peace around food so I want that for you but you can't do it alone so join us in the secret sauce group for sure um, yeah, so here we go. And I just want to um, welcome my guest, uh, Cindy Watson. I'm going to talk about you here, Cindy, but welcome. <laughs> Glad you're here. Great to be here. Thanks so, so much for Cindy having Watson, me. totally. Cindy Watson is the founder of, of Women on Purpose and creator of the Art of, Fem of Feminine Negotiation Program. She's also founder and managing partner of Watson Labor Lawyers as an attorney specializing in social justice law for the past 30 years. Um, she's an international speaker, award-winning author, and consultant known for her passion, commitment, and ability to inspire, which she inspires me all the time. Uh, Cindy believes all of... Yeah, Cindy believes all of life is a negotiation and she's dedicated to helping people leverage their innate powers of persuasion to get what they want and deserve from the boardroom to the bedroom. So welcome, Cindy. Glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Trisha. It's so great to be here with your group. I love them. Love everything about what you do. Yeah, thank you. So um, I wanted to have you on as a guest uh, because this topic of really speaking up for ourselves is so central to overcoming emotional eating. It's actually one of, one of the steps in my seven simple steps to end emotional eating is communication. Yeah. And, you know, my, my clients are getting really ninja at recognizing what they need and starting to speak up for themselves. And when they don't, they pay a price in the form of emotional eating. So there is a direct, you know, direct correlation between, you know, saying what we need and having peace around food or not saying what we need to say and stuffing it instead with food. And that's why I really, you know, I wanted to dig into this with you because this is your expertise and, you know, you are a beautiful and powerful example of a woman who gets what she wants by speaking up for herself, but yet in a feminine way. And you are so feminine. Look, we have our feminine colors on today. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't even coordinate and look at I that. Know, I know. <laughs> so I love that about you because I'm all about bright colors. And um, yeah, so how did this, you know, you've done, you know, social justice, so social justice, legal work as a lawyer for 30 years, but how did you morph into this art of feminine negotiation topic? Oh, great question. 
question. And I'm so glad that you're sharing this and that you do this work with your group all the time, because I think it is one of the most important skill sets that we will ever learn, uh, you know, because I do believe all of life is a negotiation, whether you you're negotiating with yourself, whether it's about emotional eating or any other aspect of your life, negotiating with your kids, your intimate partner, business deals. I don't care if it's about who takes out the trash or multi-million dollar deals. And the problem is we're not really taught how to negotiate or to the extent that we are, we're, we're taught what I've come to realize are absolute myths. People believe that negotiation is all about toughness, right? That toughness carries the day. It's all about the bark and the bite. And the person who talks the longest and the loudest is the person who's going to get what they want. And because of that, I find for women in particular, they end up falling into one of two camps. They either shy away from negotiation and end up losing out on so much in life and of life because they don't want that, what they perceive to be the conflict of negotiation or at the other end of the scale and I'm sure it resonates for most of your listeners are going to fall into one or the other category or you end up bringing that overcompensating masculine energy believing that that's the only way to get ahead and to succeed in this sort of masculine driven society and the good news is that neither are true and uh, in fact the thing you asked me what led me to do this I fell into that second category, to be honest, Tricia. And I, way later, I realized that wasn't my authentic self. When I thought back to when I was younger or even in law school, I took a negotiation course where we basically ended up negotiating for our marks because whoever got the highest negotiated settlement in these simulated negotiations with your classmates got the highest mark. And you can imagine in a competitive law school how challenging that was. <laughs> and I ended up winning everyone, virtually every one of those simulated negotiations. And I'm not wow. saying that to brag, but only because much later in life, then I started the practice of law and I'm some young 20 something, you know, fresh face coming in, practicing social justice, mostly with trade unions. So a male industry, male dominated niche. And certainly when I started practice, as you say, dating myself, it was 30 years ago, I was almost always the only woman in the room. So I felt like the only way to be heard and taken seriously was to rip it open. And I built quite a reputation and I am embarrassed now to say I wore it like a badge of honor, to be quite honest. My clients called me the Barracuda, and I thought they meant it as a compliment, and I took it as a compliment. And it wasn't until much later in life, you know, my daughter ended up getting diagnosed with a heart defect as a baby. Mm -hmm. And we spent three months in the hospital for sick kids. Basically, I wasn't conscious of it at the time, Tricia, but effectively negotiating for her life every day. If 99% of the population reacted this way, Jade was always the 1% that reacted the opposite way. And I learned really quickly and on instinct. It wasn't until later that I actually developed my Art of Feminine Negotiation program. But I realized in hindsight that in that hospital, much like when I was in that negotiating course in law school, I wasn't ripping it open. I wasn't coming from a place of toughness or bark. It was all about rapport building, building rapport with the nurses and the doctors and the administraff and having that empathy, bringing empathy to the table, putting myself in their shoes. And how could I use that to be able to have them feel comfortable, but to get what I needed, right? To get what I needed to keep my daughter alive having the flexibility and trusting our intuition and building that trust, both trusting in myself and building trust with the others. And I sat back and thought, and sorry, this is a long way to answer your question. No, it's great. But I recognize if you think of that, you know, rapport building, empathy, flexibility, intuition, and trust, those are five of the six key factors that make and mark the most effective negotiators and persuaders, influencers, call it whatever you're most comfortable with. And all five of those would be considered feminine traits by almost anyone you ask. And then I really had a couple of, you know, situations in my own life where I felt like, you know, I'm not loving the professional relationships that I have being this barracuda. There's a big price to pay. And then it's like this little toxic poison that creeps into your rela intimate relationships or your relationship with your kids. And then it starts affecting how you feel about yourself. And one day I just, you know, I woke up and I looked in the mirror, having this discussion with my son. And, you know, he's like, for God's sake, mom, does every discussion with you have to be an argument that you win? And it sounds like nothing. But for me, I think it was just the final straw in a whole series. And I 
everything flipped for me in that moment. I remembered that course in law school. I remembered how I was effective tapping into my authentic feminine, natural, intuitive strengths and the same in the hospital. And so I've been on a mission ever since to help other women leverage their power in ways that are really authentic to them. Yeah, that is so beautiful. I love that story. And another word that comes up for me is humility. I, I'm sure when your daughter was sick, you know, I mean, that really flattens a parent, right? To have that kind of, you know, threat to her life. And I bet you had just that beautiful quality of humility as in, you know, it, which is probably what enabled you to, you know, to really befriend these, you know, staff people and, and, and really make those associations because you weren't better than or making demands. You knew like you had the innate sense of we're in this together and I need your help. And that, that, that humility is such a beautiful quality. And people, I think, believe that if they're humble, they're going to get squashed, yes. but that's not my experience, you know, if you have the balance of humility, you know, and open heartedness, but also, you know, smarts and, 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 and an idea that you do need to stand for yourself. So I'm excited about this conversation. Yeah. That's, that's really, really amazing. Um, and I love that. And if I can just add to that, yeah. I think it's so important what you just hit on there, Tricia, that idea about that humility and open heartedness. And I would add to that as well, because it was a later epiphany for me. And that was that vulnerability. Because again, I think for so many women, they feel that being vulnerable after being told for so long, there's no place for emotion in a boardroom or there's no place for emotion in business. And again, coming from that very masculine energy. And yeah. I've come to find the opposite is true. One where it, and whether you come from either side of those two, two branches that I talked about, when you're able to bring vulnerability and use it authentically, it yeah. up levels your persuasive abilities tenfold. So yeah, I have found that personally for myself. If I come from my, you know, in my business, I come from my personal experience. I talk about my experience of having been 50 pounds overweight, my experiences over, over, you know, what it takes to overcome emotional eating. But I always feel like when I come from my personal experience, what it takes to heal, nobody can really argue with that. Like it's my experience. I'm not in my head. I'm really in my heart. And when I come from yeah. that heart place, it's like, there's no argument to be had. That's my experience, you know, yeah. and you, you can not like it or you can have something else to say about it. But I stand so firmly on my experience and, and on, you know, my emotional, like, like where I'm coming from, you know, from the heart. And it does cut down on a lot of the friction in a conversation and it settles, kind of keeps me calm because I'm like, well, my experience personally yeah. is blah, blah, blah. And it's like, Okay. <laughs> you know, like there's, it sort of stops the fight, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I love that because that also touches on, because I'd mentioned the five sort of key elements to being a great negotiator. And the sixth one is assertiveness. And that's where most women get that little, oh, I'm either here or I have to be here. Right. And it's because we conflate assertive with aggressive and they're not mm. the same thing. And how you described it is so beautiful, Tricia, because assertiveness is really nothing more than confidence. And that confidence comes from knowing. So for you, that knowledge came from your inner knowing, your personal experience. And for other women, if it's something that you don't have a lot of experience with, you can still bring that assertiveness to the table, that confidence in knowing just by doing some simple preparation techniques. And that's one of the things we really offer in our programs is just here are some simple prep preparation tricks and tools that you can use to really just give yourself that extra level of confidence when you're stepping in, right? I so. love that. So can you give us a few of those? Um, yeah, sure. Absolutely. So we've got... Um, to be able to sort of step into your confidence, one of the things, if I can take a step back, I would say start always with that negotiating with yourself because the power of our thoughts is everything when you're negotiating your mindset, right? Your language matters. The language that you use both when you speak, but even when you're talking to yourself, that little, whether you've got your little inner critic or your inner cheerleader, the language that's being used is so important. And the thoughts that we choose really matter as well. And the meaning that we give to those thoughts matter. You know, the Cleveland Clinic did a study and the average person has 60,000 thoughts a day. And 95%, the part that wasn't so shocking to me, but the part that really surprised even me was that 95% of those 60,000 thoughts repeat 
every day. We keep having the same 95% of our thoughts. Oh, that's an awful <laughs> And statistic. worse, the worst <laughs> statistic is that 80% of those thoughts are negative, right? Yeah. Because it comes from that emotion, whether it's fear, overwhelm, self-doubt, shame, guilt, angst, grief. So the key to being able to negotiate your mindset to move out of those states is to move from fear to rock solid confidence, right? Move from angst to powerful resilience. And so much of that starts from that loving yourself unconditionally, right? So So true. And positive self-talk, just kind of, you know, being that cheerleader and get on your own side and say good things like you've got this and, and you, you know, what you have to say is important and come from that place. Yeah. And one of the little tricks that I always give in our groups just to start with is uh, keep a brag list, right? So I ask people to just keep a little journal by their bedside. Start, start by writing down 25 things that you love about yourself because we're taught, especially as young girls, not to brag on ourselves, right? right? Young boys in the schoolyard get their sense of social status by how big they make themselves. And young girls, as early as kindergarten, are taught that if you try and brag on yourself, you're going to be socially shunned. So we have this deep-seated conditioning to make ourselves smaller and to not brag on ourselves. And then that conditioning becomes that little inner critic as well. So add to that brag list every night. Just list things that you... Um, you know, things that you did that you can be proud of, qualities that you showed up as that you can be proud of, right? Everything you love and read that every night. You, we can retrain our brain. And the more we retrain our brain to come from a place of self-love, unconditional self-love, that's sort of the most powerful starting part. And I, I also recommend that. this mirror exercise. I think it was Jack Canfield where I first heard it. I'm not even sure. But, and it's tough to do at first, but ba- every night before you go to bed, look in a mirror. And really make that eye contact, which is awkward, right? It's going to feel really, and I'll warn all of you out there, it'll feel really ridiculous at first and you'll feel uncomfortable. But if you can push past that and do it every night, just look in the mirror, make eye contact with yourself and address yourself by name and just have a little conversation where you acknowledge yourself for the things that you could be proud of that day. And they don't have to be earth shattering. They can be really simple things like, like speaking up for yourself. I'm really proud about how you stood up and held your boundaries on this particular issue today, Cindy, you know, and talk to yourself and list as many as you can think of, and then look yourself right in the eyes and say, I love you and hold your gaze because the temptation is going to be to be embarrassed and walk away and do that every night right so Mm, i love that and in in my um in my program you know we do these private you know these zoom calls together and i always have the women focus on what's going right with their week you know because all they want to do is tell me everything they're doing wrong you know like or every whatever way they they feel like they messed up they want to tell me about it and i'm like look (laughs) <laughs> let's talk about, let's, you know, like retrain our brains and talk about what you're doing right. Because yeah. uh, our brains just go to, the, go to the negative every single time. Yeah. And, and people will start to discover, oh, yeah, this was good. I did this. You know, this was something I, different I did, a new tool that I used, and it went well. You know, and I just love having people focus on that positive because it does, I think it does change our neural pathways and help us to be more of our own advocates. Yeah. I love that. And it's funny because that's a big part of what I always harp on about as well. And in my new book, I talk about it because I I say, start by like, acknowledge your feelings. Absolutely. Whether you're feeling, you know, shame, guilt, angst, acknowledge it without judgment. That's the key. And give yourself permission to feel, but then make a decision not to stay there, right? Because recognize that it's a choice, right? We, we can't control what happens outside in the world, but we can control our thoughts and how we react. So what we resist persists. So when we're beating up on ourselves, we actually end up calling more of that to us. So if our thoughts and the meaning that we give them create our reality, I always say, why not focus on what you want rather than what, on what you don't? Why not focus on what, as you say, what's going right rather than what's going wrong? Why not choose to reach for a better reality? Like always, and especially in times of adversity, right? So, uh, so beautiful, girl. You're singing my song. I love it. <laughs> Just great and juicy stuff. So back to those tools for preparedness. Yes. yes and sorry, I actually didn't really give a direct No, answer. no, it's all good. 
One simple but really powerful tool, and I'll just scratch the surface of it here today, but I'm also happy to share. I have a, a free ebook on this as well. So for my yeah. nutrition, I'm happy to share that resource. It's I call it your five secret weapons to effective negotiating. And what it is, it's basically just the five W's. This is one simple little hack, if you will. I don't love that term, but so basically you think who, what, where, when, and why. So for every negotiation or discussion or conversation where you want to influence or persuade, whatever word you're comfortable using and having those dialogues or discussions, you always stop for a moment and pause. And in advance of going into them, part of your preparation work is to go through this simple five W's. So you start with the why, for example. All right. And let's use money as an example. If you're negotiating about money, right? Um, everybody always assumes, well, what, there's no deep why. It's just about the money. Not true. Almost nothing is what we, when we're negotiating about something, it's rarely about what we think it is. There's always a deeper why attached. So money is the beautiful example because most people mistakenly believe it's just dollars and cents, but it's not. It's what that money represents for you and for that other person. Maybe for you, that money's a much needed romantic retreat to rekindle your failing relationship. Maybe to send your kid to camp for a program that they desperately need. Maybe it's for status. Maybe it's to prove to yourself or to someone else that, you know, I can do this and I matter. Whatever that it is, really tap into your deep why. And usually I advocate that you go at least, at least five, preferably seven layers deep, right? So whatever your first answer, okay, why does this matter to me? Whatever your first answer is, then you say, why does that matter to me? Whatever answer you get to that, and why does that matter to me? And it's a beautiful exercise. It opens you up to a greater awareness of yourself and your own motivations. And for most people, it comes down, like the first time I did that, I remember being shot. It left me just kind of a little shaken, but then with this greater awareness because i grew up in a low rental apartment in a really tough neighborhood and we didn't have much so i had that striver driver achiever that often comes with that right but when i start tapping into my deep whys so much of it was i want to have the freedom to be feel like i'm in control of my own life and circumstances well when you recognize that for example about yourself you're able to show up differently in those negotiations, right? So powerful. And then the flip of that is always consider what's the why of the other person you're gonna be discussing it with. And again, whether it's, I'm talking your intimate partner or your kids or in business relationships, personally or professionally, as Trisha said at the beginning, from the boardroom to the bedroom, think about your why, think about their why, right? And then, so that's that, you know, who, what, where, when, why. So, and you always want to think about the where as well. So in any conversation, you know, some conversations ought to take place in the bedroom, for example, and some definitely not, right? Some you want at the dinner table, some maybe while you're on vacation, same in the work context, maybe not a firm retreat or at the water cooler or in the formal office. Considering something as simple as the where with intention can be such a game changer. Mm, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. And same with the when, right? Do you remember, Trisha, as a kid, we instinctively knew if we wanted something really important, don't ask your parents when they're in a really bad mood, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> we lose that skill. We grow up and we're like, okay, I need this now. As you say, I'm going to have to make it. No, just think about the when, the timing, right? Asking for a salary increase when they just had the worst quarter ever. Maybe that's not the best timing. The flip side is the same. If you've just really contributed something, now is maybe a great time, you know? Asking your intimate partner if it happens to be a male, you know, during the Super Bowl about something important in the final quarter, perhaps not the best time. So <laughs> considering that when with intention and the same with your kids, like decide is now a good time, right? And the what, there's a whole list of what's like the, what you think you're negotiating is the obvious, but I encourage you to just go a little deeper in that preparation as well. You know, what are the likely issues on the table? What are some questions? I can answer? What are their objections likely to be? Thinking about this stuff in advance gives you that, as I say, you'll feel more prepared, which will give you the knowledge that you need, which will give you the confidence. And then you'll be able to show up in a place of more assertiveness when you're negotiating. Super, super important tool. And the last W is the who. And people overlook this. Who do you want to show up as, right? And that may seem like a silly question. but And by that, I usually advocate for people in life generally, pick three words that describe 
who you, how you want to show up. And there's no right or wrong answer, right? It's because these are your words. Maybe for you, it's bold, courageous. Maybe it's grateful. Maybe it's present, you know, whatever your words are. And just every time you're going to go into a discussion, have a little trigger for yourself. Maybe it's just touching the door jam. That's my favorite, to be honest, because if you're about to walk into a room, whether it's a boardroom or again, that bedroom or your kid's room, or you're coming home from work into the place, just tap the door jam and let go of whatever's happened and say, here's how I want to show up. So that's one important version of who, but also think, who is the other person likely to show up as? Are they coming in their role as, you know, human resource manager or CEO? Are they coming in their role as my friend? How are, who are they likely to be showing up as? And to be able to use that. Like I know myself, I have screwed up and I teach this stuff, but when I'm wanting to have a discussion with my daughter, for example, I come in mom mode and I care too much and I handle the conversation in a way that I would never do if I was coaching a client. So me showing up as mom, instead of being able to take that step back and think, how would I handle this more objectively? How would I advise somebody else to handle it? Game changer, Trisha. Those simple five W's are a great little technique to be able to show up differently. I love that. That was so useful. It's really, really powerful. And I love the show up as one because um, because it's really like intention setting. Like it's really getting clear and it's like sort of envisioning, you know, when I'm having this conversation, how do I want to be received? You know, who, who am I in that moment? You know, I don't want to be my bitchy, forceful self, you know, which rarely comes out, honestly. I mean, just, <laughs> just once in a blue moon. <laughs> But, you know, I want to be present. I want to be, you know, received with open arms. I don't want to put somebody on the defensive. I want to be fair, you know, and so really kind of playing that out. It's, you know, there's been studies about when we do envision something going well, it does, you know, it's so much more likely to go well. So that intention setting, I think, is such a great, great suggestion. Yeah. Um, I want to bring up something which I think is really um, hard for emotional eaters. And that's just the whole idea of conflict. Okay. Emotional eaters run from conflict, like the plague, like, you know, and that's, and it oftentimes fuels our eating because instead of speaking up for ourselves, you know, cause our, our thought of conflict is it's going to be world war three. We're going to be rejected. You know, we're going to be hated. We're going to be ostracized. Like all the worst possible scenarios is what run through our mind, like a quick film. Yeah. And then we're like, I want nothing to do with that. I'm going to say nothing. And then of course, instead of saying it, we stuff it with food. Yeah. So can we reframe the idea of conflict in a way that maybe makes people a little less reticent to have those tough conversations? Absolutely. I'm so glad you went there because really that, that was the start, the building block, if you will, to my entire programming, right? I started with this idea, as I said, about thinking back to the hospital. And so I developed sort of what I called sort of the core foundation is my, it's, I call it the R fit model. I wanted sort of a, you know, just an anagram that people would be able to remember. So R fit, A R E F I T. Just remember you are fit to negotiate really effectively. So okay. that's those six keys, right? Assertiveness, rapport building, empathy, flexibility, intuition, and trust. Nice. So I want to take that as a starting point because okay. it changes the, your, it totally reframes how you approach negotiations. They don't have to be conflict driven. In fact, they shouldn't be conflict driven. And one of the beauties of showing up from this model, from an R fit model, is that it totally reframes everything you've ever been taught about what it means to negotiate, to get what you desire, right? To ask for what you want in life, to be able to step up in ways that are authentic and not conflict-based so you don't have to shy away. And, and leave the A on the side for the moment because the assertiveness we sort of already have talked about. And it's not what you think. Assertiveness, as I say, can be coming from a total calm, collected place of knowing, right? Gr Which, and grounded. Totally grounded. It's a beautiful space to come from, um, you know, drawing on that instinct. And that is such an important reframe 
of the process to be able to get rid of that fear of conflict. But also just think about it. If you're coming with intent, you've done your prep on the five W's, right? Which is sort of a more practical skill set for prep. But if you come with the mindset about, okay, rapport building is going to be my big focus here and empathy. Let's start with those first two, right? When you're approaching a discussion and you're going, okay, empathy, I want to start by putting myself in the shoes of the other party. And when I do this with my coaching clients and they're calling in a panic about a, a situation that they're stressing about and I, I need some advice on this, I'm like, okay, just ground yourself again, take a deep breath for a moment, take a step back and let's look at this. So put yourself in the shoes of the other party right now. What are they going to be thinking? What are their concerns going to be? What are the things that make them defensive? Because we want to avoid that. We want to avoid that conflict. And if you take that moment to recognize and be empathetic and put yourself in their shoes, that's not to say you have to be a pushover. Just being aware of that will change how you show up in that discussion. Like it's one thing and I'll use an example recently where there was an expectation there was going to be a conflict in a work situation because somebody's boss had given direction that was contrary to the human resource director's sort of assessment of this investigation she was handling. And people were um, upset about bullying by the boss. So now you're going to have to go and have this difficult conversation with your boss to basically say, you're the problem. Everybody's bullying. Clearly, that would be an approach that would lead to conflict in the conversation, as opposed to, all right, empathy, what's going to be in their mind? They want to still be seen to be in control. They definitely don't want to be seen to be a bully and going through that factors. How can I build rapport, right? How can I bring that empathy and rapport? Well, I'll make sure that I frame the conversation as if I'm looking out for their interests, which is also true. You know, my biggest concern and, you know, priority is always protecting our organization. It happened to be a nonprofit is protecting our organization and obviously protecting you as the executive director. And with that, I'm a little concerned that maybe if we take the approach that you are thinking about, we're going to leave ourselves liable to potential occupational health and safety liability or under the human rights code. This one's a little technical, but you get the idea, right? Yeah. So to be able to say, I'm coming from a place of concern for you. I know you want this, or I know this is important to you. And here's what's important to me. And so then you start start building rapport. And there are really simple ways to be able to build rapport. So one is just bringing that empathy and trying to meet the other's needs. Find things that you have in common. You know, I recently was entering a discussion with somebody and it was in a little competitive environment, frankly. And, um, you know, one of the people there happened to be Canadian. So I made a point of saying, oh, it's so good to see Canada in the house. I feel like I'm home here, right? Just <laughs> having that little thing to build that rapport but also mirroring. Like you could probably tell, sometimes I can talk really quickly and I get very excited and passionate. For somebody who's speaking at a really slow pace, who needs to be really grounded, they're going to find that approach off-putting in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So really being aware of the people on the other side, match their speaking, try and mirror them, makes a big difference in terms of the tone of voice that you bring. Literally lower your voice if you need to, or the opposite. If they speak more excitedly, try and increase your pace a little bit. So those kind of little tips and building trust as well. When you come at any discussion, no matter how intense you think it may be, if you have that forethought to think about that empathy piece, building rapport and building trust, and then come back to trust on your intuition and be flexible, it is going to absolutely change the quality. And I guess the last thing I'd say, because you asked for um, sort of how do we deal with that conflict thing, I talk a lot um, sort of in our programs as well, specifically on conflict resolution, about that call it self-preservation or self-protection loop versus getting up into a self-management loop where we manage ourselves. Because normally, you know, I talked earlier about the emotions. We're so driven as humans by emotions. And as women in particular, the reality is we do tend to be, we can be very emotion driven. And that's not a bad thing. That can be a good thing. So long as we learn to manage and use those in ways that are constructive. Mm -hmm. Fear, for example, can just be, fear is the flip side of excitement. So being able to see, I always say to my coaching clients, when you're feeling those butterflies, think of it as internal applause. Yay, you're getting out 
outside your comfort zone, you know? Oh, <laughs> that is so sweet. I love that, Cindy. It's, it's corny, but it works, right? I, <laughs> it's I love really that. beautiful. <laughs> I love that reframe. So, but getting, when we find ourselves in those lower emotional states, you know, that fear, shame, guilt, anger, resentment, jealousy, whatever it may be, that's when we're going to be reactive. We're going to be projecting. We're going to be putting off vibes that will increase potential for conflict. Okay. So recognizing that and going through, as we talked about at the beginning, acknowledge your feelings take a deep breath and choose not to stay there and then enter into any number of exercises that will change, allow you to change your state so you can get into a state where you manage yourself. And the more you do that, you build the confidence because you build the competence in it. And there's a loop called the confidence competence loop and it keeps spiraling ever up. When we put ourselves out there and we try something like this approach may be new for you and that's great. So just give it a little try. And as you try it, you'll get a little more competence in it. And if you get some success, you're going to feel a little more confident, which will let you want to try it a bit more, which will give you more competence, which will then give you more confidence and so on up you go. So, and same with that self-protection, self-preservation versus self-management loop, we can go ever up, up, up by handling ourselves in that way. So I love that. It's a, prog it's a progressive thing. You, and it's, it's just like eating healthy, really. It's a yes. great analogy. You know, you know, when you do something healthy for yourself, you feel a little bit better and a little bit more energized and, and willing to do something else healthy for yourself. And when you oh, do something true. else healthy for yourself and you feel better and you're a little bit less out of, you know, you're, you're further out of the hole, you have more energy to do something healthy for yourself and it just, you know, ex expands on itself in a progressive way. So that is the perfect illustration of that. <laughs> and I just want to touch on that as well. The pause is really important though, because I kind of glided over that when I talked about each of these loops, mm -hmm. there's the pause in between that's so important, right? And there's this beautiful quote. I talk a lot about how to maintain control in the face of chaos, right? Just gen whether in negotiations or in the face of COVID or in the face of the race riots or any adversity you may be f facing in your life because we always have some form of adversity that we deal with. And it's between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And I love mm. that quote because our experiences of life come from the emotional reaction that we have, to, that we, you know, attach to those experiences. And in that pause, we get to choose the meaning that we're going to attach to things and the reaction that we're going to have. And your room for growth is right there in that beautiful pause, right? Yes. And I will say for this particular audience to whom I talk a lot about self-care, you know, and self-care secrets like meditation and prayer and journaling, you know, when we do that self-care first thing in the morning, one of the byproducts is the ability to pause. You know, that pause is, that's sort of like, you gotta, you gotta exercise that muscle, that pause, that's the, you know, that's not an easy thing to do. But my experience is if I have meditated first thing in the morning, if I have said my prayers, if, I've, if I'm more connected with divine source, then I can, I have more like emotional stability and groundedness from which to pause and make that decision. If I haven't done my self care, I'm more reactive. I'm quicker to anger, you know, to, to jump to conclusions about what she meant by that, you know, and yeah. it just goes ugly fast. So, you know, another reason why, you know, not only to overcome emotional eating, but to, to really sidestep you know, sidestep conflicts that don't need to happen, you know, is yeah. to really get grounded first thing in the morning. And then I can, again, you know, approach a conversation with a lot more e equilibrium and, and choose to take the high road, see how they might be feeling, you know, sort of do that, um, you know, that bonding, like you said, the rapport building, it's so much easier to do when you really put that, you know, spiritual money in the bank, in my experience, emotional money in the bank, first thing in the morning. I love that. And it's funny, as you were talking to about that resistance, especially within your beautiful group to the conflict, one other little trick that I do, and you guys may want some other time to even have make a game of it or a challenge within your group, Trisha, and I call it, it's go for no. And there's a book by Richard Fenton of the same name. And it's such a simple concept because 
as women, we tend to have that higher fear of rejection, fear of hearing that no, right? Yeah. Fear, and that so affects how we are able to show up. So I often play a game and really encourage the women in my groups and programs as well to, to go for no, make a game of it. So, and let's the easiest example just to, but you can apply this in any area of your life. You know, if we want to get over one fear, you need to build up some resistance. So how do we end up desensitizing ourselves to that word no? And it's by going for no. So let's say if you're a salesperson and you need to make 10 sales, you know, a week to be able to, to survive and to make those 10 sales, you normally need to ask about 100 people. If you're going like, oh, I need to get 10 yeses, your entire physiology kind of is like as you're getting those calls and you're cringing about getting the no, right? And it affects how you show up. And then even when you get those first couple of yeses, what do most of us do? Oh, good. We put our, take our foot off the gas a little bit, right? But if you condition yourself in this or in every aspect of your life, I'm going to go for the no's. If I need to ask a hundred people, I'm going for a hundred no's this week. And then when you're going through, if you get the no, it starts to take the sting out of it. You're sort of training your brain, right? To take the sting out of it. And when you get the yeses, they're a nice perk and they build up. And the studies have shown that teams that use that approach in business and also in your personal life get way better results because you're showing up and you can just afford to be your total, natural, authentic self because you're not afraid of the no anymore. You're convincing yourself you're going for it. You're embracing it, right? I love that. I love that too. I did a podcast once about the word ask because I feel like we you know as women we don't ask enough like we're because of that fear of rejection you know that's what makes us beat around the bush or be passive aggressive or whatever you know indirect in our communication yeah. but just coming out and asking for something you know is okay you know we're, we're, there's no harm in asking Absolutely. I mean G Jesus said ask and you shall receive right <laughs> so you know, asking is so, so important. And if we do embrace that attitude, like you're talking about, like the worst that can happen is someone can say no or be mad that we ask, but we have a right to ask, you know, it's, it's very direct communication. Absolutely. And, um, and it really does help, like you said, to gamify it and see, you know, just, just like how many no's we can do because it yeah. is a, it is a conditioning too. Like if, when you get a no and you realize you're not going to die from it, like you can go <laughs> on, like life goes on, right? Absolutely. <laughs> then Absolutely. it's like, yeah. Big deal. And you know, right about the stats because they show that 62% of men, when they're given an initial job offer, will ask for more money as compared to only 7% of women. Like, wow. think about that staggering difference. So, that's one of the other things I really encourage my groups to do is just every day set targets for yourself of three things you're going to ask for. Just get comfortable asking and minimum. And again, you get that competence, confidence. So just put yourself out there and ask for three things. And no doesn't always mean no forever. It might be no for now. And silence right. certainly doesn't mean no, but we cringe from it. So conditioning yep. for that is important. Yeah, we take it on and take it personally. Oh, okay, yeah. before we sh like close this, close this amazing conversation out, <laughs> I, I want to just cover the bedroom parts because we did okay. say... Uh, speaking up in the boardroom, from the boardroom to the bedroom. So any tips for, you know, a lot of people listening have been in long-term marriages, you know, so they might be in a groove of just things being the way they are, but, you know, relationships can always be improved and new, new things can always be introduced, so to speak. So, Absolutely. so how do you encourage women to just get a little bit more confident in, in speaking up about what they want, especially, you know, in personal and intimate relationships? Oh, I love that. And again, we could do a whole hour show on that, but I know. at the very end, <laughs> I think the easiest answer for that, that right now would be just, and also just to reinforce what we've already talked about about to give you that competence and confidence in it is just start by using the, the, I would say two of the skills that we talked about. Well, three, I guess. One is the five W's, right? So when you're going to have that discussion or decide how to introduce, it doesn't even have to be a discussion. It could be just something you do, right? And that, so when you're about to have that, decide again, the when and the where 
and the who you want to show up as, right? And what are some of the things that maybe you want to introduce into your sex life in the bedroom? What are some of the things you want to get rid of? Maybe no more TV in the bedroom or whatever, something as simple as that, right? Uh, maybe a little gameplay, role play, whatever it is for you, right? To be able to find out what is it that I want to be changing here? And then that who again, who am I going to show up as? So think with intention. So much of it is just about intention, Tricia, right? Coming with, as opposed to when we make mistakes, it's when we're reactive in the moment. So just think about those five W's and apply it to whatever you want, whether it's your sex life or more intimacy or whatever for you means is, is your, your sort of bedroom wants and desires. But also in addition to the five W's, apply that R fit model, right? Just always think that rapport, but start with that empathy piece, right? All right, what are they, what are they going to be thinking? What are they going to be worried about? And depending on your age, like, you know, maybe, if your partner's getting a little older, maybe, um, you know, performance is getting to be an issue and there's some angst around that as well. So really place yourself in their shoes, build that rapport again. Like don't just, if you do it when you're coming from a place of frustration, like you never do this anymore. Why don't we ever do this? Or this, this is that you're not, that's not rapport building, right? And you're not going to have that success. So find a way to build that rapport. You do your 5W sort of research, if you will, your tactical strategies, and then apply that R fit model and be flexible. Like that's the, the F, which we haven't talked a lot about. Maybe you think you need this. And if you open the dialogue in a way coming from a place of empathy and rapport building, it might turn out that your partner thinks they want this, but when you have open the door for that open dialogue, you're both able to come up with a solution that's even more creative and imaginative and better for both of you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the ripple effects of that will apply outside of the boardroom as well. So be flexible to be hearing with an open mind and looking for creative solutions that are going to be beneficial to both of you and ultimately always building that trust. So I would say applying those principles, happy to share. Again, I've got some blog posts on how to build intimacy and negotiating your sex life and happy to share any and all of those resources with your group as well. Oh, wow. This has been so amazing. And just on that topic, I, I will say that, you know, I'm in a new relationship. So these, you know, these conversations do need to happen, you know, just to make things, you know, just yes. to get to make sure we're on the right track and on the Absolutely. same page. And, you know, I find that when I think about what I want and I want to, you know, I start thinking, I want to have a conversation about, you know, how he can give me what I want. It, I, I, every single time I'm think I stop and I think to myself, yeah, but what are you doing? Like, you know, what, how are you giving him what he wants, you know? And so that give and take is so, so important because it, we can get so myopic into our needs or our, you know, how we can be pleased, but it's really a two way street and it always has to be that way. And that always, it always changes my head when I start thinking that way about, you know, putting myself in his shoes and how I could be a better partner. It just, it, it just, it sort of relaxes the tension in the whole yeah, thing. I love that. And I think there are two, two things you bring up there. One is always being a generous lover. Approach every one of these discussions from the mindset of how can I show up to be the most generous lover that I can. And I'm not just talking about the intimate act itself. I'm talking yeah. about how you show up, how you treat them. But also the third thing I'd mentioned before, when we talked about ask, 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 right? Ask for what you want. Have those discussions with your partner. Don't let yourself get out of that lower sort of fear or embarrassment or shame or guilt or whatever the background may be that causes that angst for you. And let yourself get up to that place of self-leadership and management so that you can ask, ask, ask for what you need. Yeah, I love it. I love this is an amazing conversation, uh, Cindy. Thank you so much for being oh, here, you. for being so generous yourself with all your knowledge and tips. Really amazing. And I think we will have to have you back for some of these deeper dives that I know we could do. So um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, My pleasure. Talk to me about this amazing gift that you're offering people and we will put it in the Facebook group so the people in the Secret Sauce group can get it first. And those listening to the podcast, you can definitely go to the show notes and uh, pick that up as well. Or if you're already smart and dip, you know, got yourself into the Secret Sauce group, you can just go to this show and look in the, and look in the comment section. But what are you giving to people? It's so amazing. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'm super excited to be sharing it because... 
Um, obviously my thing is the art of feminine negotiation. And I will say though, within my women on purpose group, um, when COVID first hit, to be honest, I just felt such of those lower sort of emotional, there was such fear and angst and global grief. And it broke my heart to watch how it was consuming people. And I thought, okay, what can I do? It only takes one match to light up a dark room. How can I be someone who shines a little light in the darkness right now? So I started doing daily Facebook Lives, talking about how, what are some simple exercises to change your state, to get a feeling out of quicksand onto solid ground, right? How can you use the power of questions to show up? How can you control the power of thoughts and where your focus goes? So a whole series. And I thought, I need to write this down. This is something I want to sort of, not to sound too corny, but to gift to the world and to get it spread out. So I wrote a book, it's about 70 pages long and I am not charging for it. I am gifting it to your group for free. Wow. Um, for, so there's the electronic version of that. But I'd also encourage if people want a lot of the stuff we talked about, just go to my webpage at www.womenonpurpose.ca and I've got the five secret weapon ebook is available there as well. Um, I've got ebooks on how to be a woman on purpose, but also about some of these negotiating tips that we've talked about too. Um, there, my blog posts have issues about how to negotiate your sex life with your intimate partner, lots and lots of free resources, but mostly I, I hope that you get some value out of my book in terms of being able to, in the face of any adversity in your life, get yourself to a more empowered state. So. I love that. What's the name of the book? The book's called Negotiate from Fear to Powerful resilience shining light in the darkness so oh so beautiful thank you so much for that very generous gift that sounds amazing and everybody you can go to the show notes or in the comment section in the secret sauce group so thanks so much cindy i have one more question for you that i ask my guests typically which is what is your deepest hunger this being the heal your hunger show oh i love that and I love, oh my gosh, as you did said it, I got thinking of the different hungers I've had at different stages of my life. I would say right now, my deepest hunger actually is to make a profound, to have a profound impact, empowering other women to step into their place of feminine power. I am, that is something I am so passionate about. I can taste it. I can see it. I can feel it. So I definitely have a hunger for that. Oh yeah. And you're doing it. You are, you're on fire. I, you know, as your friend, I've witnessed, you know, all the amazing things and tools mm -hmm. that you have made available to people over the past several months. So thank you for your hard work and effort in making that all happen. Likewise, so Trisha. thanks so much. God thank bless you. you. Thanks for Love having you me. so much. And thanks everybody for tuning in Take until care. the next show. We'll see you. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to get free support, insider health info, exclusive invites to events, and more, visit HealYourHunger.com.